Hello all Royal Rangers, my name is Commander Matthew Kenslow and I'm over here in the United States of America and I've been a Royal Ranger for 20 years and year number 7 as a commander. Thank you so much for checking out this video. The purpose of this video is to go over a merit. In these videos I'm going to walk through every one of the requirements. Now it's important to note that while watching these videos it will not give you the merit. You have to show to your commander that you have watched and learned from these videos. What I recommend you doing is taking down notes for each requirement and then show them to your commander for approval. Some of the purposes of Royal Rangers is to build knowledge, wisdom, skills, and leadership attributes while learning about God's Word and conserving His resources practically and most importantly to have fun doing it. So I'm Commander Matthew Kenslow from the United States of America and be blessed. Hi everybody, welcome to the fingerprinting merit. In fact, welcome to dermatoglyphics. Dermato means skin and glyphics refers to carving, like hieroglyphics. And in sense, this is the study of fingerprinting. Another name is dactylography, kind of a bit like a pterodactyl. Uh, dactyl refers to fingers and toes, and graphy refers to writing. So in this merit, we're going to be learning all about fingerprints. Not even identical twins have the same fingerprints. The chances of two people sharing the same fingerprints are 1 in 64 billion. A guy named Golton uh, calculated that. I don't know how he calculated that. But as of July 2020, the population of the world is only 7.8 billion people approximately. Again, it's, it's a very low chance to finding two people with the same exact fingerprints. Fingerprints are used for identification in both civil law and criminal law, and we'll talk more about that in Requirement 5. This is possible because fingerprints do not change as we grow older, and we'll learn about a guy named Herschel that established that. Everywhere we touch, we leave behind fingerprints. These fingerprints are known as latent fingerprints, so let's do a couple of experiments. If you take a pencil and you scribble it on a piece of paper and then put your thumb or finger on it and press hard that's kind of bit like pressing your finger on ink and then you can press your finger on the other parts of the paper that you haven't scribbled and you will leave behind a fingerprint another experiment that you could do is take a piece of tape and tape around your finger and then take the tape off and hold it up to the light and you should see your fingerprint but how do we leave behind fingerprints Look closely at the palm of your hand. Now look closer at the finger. Finally, look even closer to the tip of that finger, and what do you see? You see all these ridge lines, and that is your fingerprint that you leave behind. Fingerprints allow us to pick up objects uh, because it adds friction, which is basically a, a, a force that prevents slipperiness. Otherwise, the entire world would pretty much be slippery to us. So let's start with requirement one. Make a timeline showing the history of fingerprinting. So take out a sheet of paper and title it the history of fingerprinting. And then I want you to draw a long line with nine tick marks. And this timeline isn't going to be proportional uh, to the length of time between the events that we're going to talk about. So it doesn't have to be like unequally spaced. You could just equally space it like I have here. So let's begin with ancient times. Do you know that the use of fingerprints have been around for a long time, such as in China and Babylon? Here's an example of using fingerprints thousands of years ago. And these were found on clay seals, clay tablets, and they were used for business more than anything. They weren't used for identifying people yet. The next entry is 1686 and 1823, where we have Malpighi and Perkinji. And they were both anatomy professors at a university. In fact, I heard of Perkinji before. In the cardiac conduction system of the heart, you have fibers called Perkinji fibers. So usually if you're a scientist and you make a discovery, there's chances are there's going to be something named after you. Well, anyway, both of these anatomy professors 
were the ones who noticed the ridges on the fingers, but none of them realized the importance of these ridges. They both studied and pointed them out in the different patterns, and that was pretty much their contribution to fingerprints. The next entry is 1858, and we have Herschel, Sir William Herschel, and he was a British officer in India. Now this isn't the same Sir William Herschel, the astronomer, this is a different one, just to say. And while in India, he had a lot of contracts that he had to make uh, for the natives. And the natives believe that if you have physical contact with legal contracts, then it's more binding, it, it's like, it's more special than to sign your name. But as time went on, Herschel studied these fingerprints, and he realized that fingerprints are different, and these could actually prove a person's identity. Herschel studied these fingerprints for over a half a century. Uh, in fact, I believe if you see the fingerprints down at the bottom here, the lower left, I believe these are Herschel's fingerprints that he collected over a span of 57 years. But what did he determine? You'll always keep your same fingerprints. The next entry is in 1880, and we have Folds. Dr. Henry Folds. He was a Scottish doctor and missionary and took up the study of fingerprint ridges. He began to recognize the importance of fingerprints. In fact, there's a story where there was a person arrested and Dr. Folds saw the fingerprints at the crime scene and took the suspect's fingerprints and they were clearly different. So the suspect was released due to the fingerprint evidence presented by Folds. Dr. Folds also helped develop a classification system and a form uh, to record fingerprints. He gave this to none other than Sir Charles Darwin. But Charles Darwin was up in age and he was in ill health and he promised to give them to his cousin, Francis Galton, which we'll talk about here shortly. But first, let's go on with, to the next entry, 1882, and we have Thompson. Gilbert Thompson worked for the U.S. Geological Survey in New Mexico, United States, and he used his own fingerprints on documents to prevent forgery. And here's his fingerprint with $75 over it, and that was, again, to uh, prevent anybody else from forging uh, his signature. And what made this special? This is the first known use of fingerprints in the United States. Remember that the other people that we were talking about were in India um, and other places in Europe. This is the first uh, known use in the United States. Okay, next is in 1888, and now we're going to talk about Sir Francis Galton, Darwin's cousin. And he began his study on fingerprints based on what Dr. Henry Folds uh, gave to him. And again, he was the one that calculated that the chances of two people having fingerprints is one in 64 billion. Again, this was uh, way over 100 years ago. Um, I'm not sure how he calculated that, but he was an extremely intelligent person. He made discoveries, he made inventions, and he studied a wide uh, variety of different fields, from statistics to psychology, sociology, anthropology, geography, um, genetics, meteorology, and more. He did a lot of uh, different things. But in fingerprinting, he came up with eight main categories. And from these, there were three main patterns, the loop, the whirl, and the arch. And we'll talk about that later. But the reason why he took up fingerprinting as a study is because he wanted to know if fingerprints determine heredity and or intelligence. But it didn't. However, he did validate Herschel and Folds that no two fingerprints are exactly the same and don't change throughout the person's lifetime. Okay, the next entry is 1901. Henry. Sir Edward Richard Henry, which we will talk more about shortly, developed an interest in fingerprints and a solution, more like a revision, to the Galton classification system problem. This was called Henry classification system and was officially adopted by Scotland Yard, which had been the headquarters of Metropolitan Police in London, England. And in fact, on July 1st, 1901, the Metropolitan Police Fingerprint Bureau was established. The Henry classification system was developed in India, and his system is still in use today. 
but as we'll find out later, he was only one of a few who developed it. Alright, in 1903, we have prisons and military. In 1903, the New York prison system began the first real use of fingerprints in the U.S. for criminals. In 1905, the U.S. Army began using fingerprints, followed by the U.S. Navy in 1907, followed by the United States Marine Corps in 1908. And finally, 1924, we have the Identification Division of the FBI. An act of Congress created this. At this time, all fingerprint files from the Leavenworth Prison in Kansas and the National Bureau of Criminal Identification were given to the FBI. Okay, let's move on to requirement two. Explain how people leave fingerprints and why fingerprints are considered so important in the identification of people. The second part is name the surfaces of the body where friction and papillary ridges are found. People leave fingerprints because of oil and sweat. Here is a cross section or an inner look of our skin. This is what is underneath our skin and all the layers. The three main layers are the epidermis, dermis, and hypodermis. I want to draw your attention to this structure right here. This is a sudoriferous gland which means it secretes sweat. And then, if you look over here by the hair follicle, you have another gland called the sebaceous gland, which secretes oil. So our skin secretes oil and sweat, and this creates a film or a coating around our fingers. It is these substances that we give off when we leave behind fingerprints. In fact, the very fine powder in dusting sticks to the oils of the latent fingerprints. And that's how it's possible to dust for fingerprints, which we'll talk about later. So a brief recap, our skin secretes oil and sweat, it creates a coating around our fingers, and those substances are what's given off. This is important in the identification of people because everyone has their own unique set of fingerprints. This is a closer look at fingerprints. This is an actual microscopic cross-sectional view of our fingerprints. The surfaces on the body where these are found are the hands and feet. When you look closely at your hand, your feet, your fingers, or your toes, and you see all those ridges, those ridge lines that, that we uh, saw earlier, this is it right here. They're like hills and valleys. And these are known as friction or papillary ridges. And think about how fingerprints help us to pick up objects uh, because it increases the friction. That's probably one of the reasons why they are known as friction ridges. In fact, that's why you could leave both handprints and footprints because of these ridges. Okay, let's move on to requirement three. Describe the Bertillon system of identification. List one example of when the Bertillon system failed to show the difference between two people while the fingerprint comparison showed the difference. So this is Alphonse Bertelin, and he was not a criminal. In fact, he was a criminologist. He was a French police officer who came up with the mugshot. The Bertelin system of identification uses skeletal body part measurements to show differences between people. This technique was called anthropometry, which literally means the measurement of human individuals. Anthro refers to human or human-like, and metri comes from metron, which means measurement. So, yeah, literally the measurement of human individuals. The idea was is that everybody's body measurements are different. There might be some similarities, but chances are not everything measured would be exactly the same for any two people. They would measure, um, like, hand span, they would measure height, they would measure head size, they would pretty much measure everything. It was pretty rigorous, but this is what uh, they did back in the day uh, before they trusted in fingerprints. And on top of this, the suspect had to get a mugshot. That way, for example, if the criminal escapes and they arrest somebody they think is the suspect, then they would measure everything by the Bertillon system and compare to see if the measurements line up. And if there's some differences, they got the wrong guy. Nowadays, they just check the fingerprints, but this is what they did back in the day. 
Something that you could intuitively figure out is that as time goes on, people are either going to grow or shrink or do something to themselves to alter the measurements. Here's the famous classic story of when the Bertillon system failed but gave credence, which means credibility or acceptance or confidence, uh, to using fingerprints instead. Here is Will West and he was arrested in 1903 and he was sent to the Leavenworth Penitentiary in Kansas and as you could see here they took the mugshot and the measurements but after they took the measurement something strange happened one person pulled up the records of another person who had very similar measurements and in fact the mugshot looks almost identical but this person named William West was already there since 1901. So what's going on here? You have two people that look exactly the same, that have similar measurements, and pretty much they have the same name, Will West and William West. So let's say Will West didn't do anything wrong in that time, but William West escaped. If the police were searching for William West and found Will West, they would have arrested him took the mugshot and the Bertillon system, and odds are Will West would have served time when it was really William West. So it was probably a headache uh, when this was um, surfaced and found out. However, they took the fingerprints, and as you notice, the fingerprints are in fact different. And yes, fingerprinting does take a trained eye. Sometimes they're completely different, and sometimes they look the same. But if you really look closely, fingerprints are different. And in the case of Will West and William West, the fingerprints are different. So this is the classic story of how the Bertillon system failed and gave credence to using fingerprints. So just to say, the prevailing theory is that these both were twins separated at birth. I believe other people think that they were cousins and some people think that it was just um, a wild coincidence. Well anyway, that, that's just some explanation of, of how this could have been possible. Okay, requirement four is explain the Henry classification system of fingerprint identification. Be able to identify the arch, the loop, and world pattern divisions. Also be able to identify the deltas and the cores of fingerprints. So in this requirement, we're actually going to get into examining uh, different fingerprints. The Henry classification system divides ridge patterns into three general divisions. The arch, loop, and whorl. This was developed by Sir Edward Richard Henry, Bose, and Hawk. Bose and Hawk were from uh, India and Sir Edward Richard Henry was from the United Kingdom. Just to clarify something, it was really Bose and Hawk that came up with the Henry classification system and Sir Edward Richard Henry was the supervisor and he took credit for the Henry system when it was really Bose and Hawk that did most of the work, just to tell you. But it's still called the Henry classification system. So coming up we're going to be looking at the arch, loop, and whorl patterns but the Henry classification system is more than just that. It's quite mathematical, and um, I won't be going over that, but you could do extra research if you want to. This page I found on the internet, it's not Royal Rangers. It looks like a middle school or high school project. But just concisely, each fingerprint is given a number, and you look whether or not it has the world pattern. And if it has a world pattern, it's given that value, you add up all the values of the even number of fingers and you add one and you put that over the sum of the values of the odd number of fingers and you add one and then just divide and that's your number. Everybody is given a specific number but you don't have to worry about doing that for the merit unless you're like me and you love math but don't worry you don't have to uh, do this. But essentially the Henry classification system is much more than just three ridge patterns. Um, in summary, it's the method to classify fingerprint records and exclude anybody who has a different value. Again, everybody is given a value and it's quite mathematical. So here are the three rich patterns of fingerprints. 
you notice that we have the loop, the whirl, and the arch. The whirl is pretty basic. It's basically circles, concentric circles, with a core in the middle. And then, again, concentric circles uh, coming outward. The loop starts down here, and it comes up and over. And I liken it to a bite in rope craft. If you've taken rope craft, then you know what a bite is. It's a turn on the rope. And again, it just comes, starts down here and comes up and then over. And then we have the arch, which starts down here and it comes up and over like a hill. It's kind of bit like a hill. Uh, here's a, the delicate arch in Utah and the gateway arch in Missouri for some examples of arches. And just to uh, remind you, those were three main patterns, but Galton came up with eight main categories. So yes, you have the loop, for example, but you have different types of loops. And here's a couple of examples. But first, let's talk about um, our hand uh, real quick, um, the anatomy of the skeletal system. Here you have the thumb and the pinky, and you have your forearm bones right here. There are two bones from your wrist to your elbow, and just one from your elbow to the shoulder called the humerus. Well, this bone right here on the thumb side is called the radius, and on this side, on the pinky side, is called the ulna. So you could have the radial loop and the ulnar loop. So which one is which? Here you're going to have to use your hand. On this side, you have the loop starting over here and coming up and over and back around. On this side, it's starting over here and it's coming up and over and back around. Now, if you take your finger or your thumb and you put it over the fingerprint, for example, like this, you will notice that the loop, which starts over here is starting over by the pinky side right here so if it's starting over by the pinky side that is the ona and therefore that's called the ona the ona loop and on this side if you put your thumb over it you see that the loop is starting over here on the thumb side and on the thumb side you have the radius and therefore it's called the radial loop. But if I switch hands now and I take my thumb and go like this, now the loop is starting on the pinky side. And so if this was somebody's left hand, this would be the owner loop and this would be the radial loop. So in order to find out you have to know which hand we're talking about. And that's just um, one example of a couple of variations of the loop. Okay, so now let's move on to what are cores and what are deltas. Well, if you look right here, uh, this is the core of this fingerprint pattern. And if you look closely, we know that this is the whorl because of the concentric uh, circles or ovals here. And at the very center, um, inside the smallest of the circle or the oval, is the core. So core basically means uh, center, like the core of the sun or the core of earth, for example. And in the loop, if you notice, the thinnest um, loop that you have at the very top is the core of the loop. Now, what about deltas? Delta comes from the Greek letter, and this is an uppercase Greek letter called delta. It's a triangle, so that's why they call these deltas. And as you notice over here, the loop Let's say it starts right here, it comes up, and it comes over. Well, over on this side, this part of the loop comes down this way. And the next part of the loop comes down and over that way. And so this creates a delta right here, or a triangle. And then there's another part of the loop that just comes up and over and lines uh, those other two uh, loops. So it leaves the delta. Another example here is the whorl. If you notice these ridge lines in the whorl, it comes up and around and then 
let's say this ridge line comes down here and then continues onward, well, the next ridge line could start coming up here, and now it's going the other way. It's veering off the other way. And then another ridge line comes down here and basically lines the two. It doesn't really cross over. Fingerprints don't necessarily cross over previous um, ridge lines. And so that just creates a triangle right here known as a delta. And just for fun, something extra, here's some more uh, terminology. Whenever a ridge line comes up and then just stops out of nowhere, that's called the ridge ending. Whenever the ridge line comes up and diverges into two and then converges back into one, this is known as an enclosure. Um, over here where you just have like this lone ridge line, this is known as an island, this lone dot right here. And here's a fun one. This is called bifurcation. Whenever a ridge line comes up and converges into two, but they don't converge back into one, and it just keeps on going, it's called a bifurcation. Uh, bi means two, and it's basically going from one to two different ridge lines. There's one right here, there's another one right here, and another one right here. So loops account for 65% of the population, whirls 30%, and arches 5%. I'm sure all approximate, of course. So let's move on to requirement 5. Identify 10 different ways law enforcement agencies use fingerprints. Okay, read each statement and determine how fingerprints are used. Are they used by law enforcement agencies, or is it a civil use of fingerprints? So, just to clarify, criminal law means that you're in legal trouble. You broke the law, you committed something illegal, this could be theft or breaking into somebody's property or going above the speed limit, etc. Civil law is dispute between parties. A party includes a person or an organization. So let's say two people are arguing, they have a dispute. Or if two organizations have a dispute. Or more, it doesn't have to be just two. Or maybe it's a person and an organization. If they have a dispute or one person is saying, you can't do that then they will probably go to court to have it settled out, but it doesn't mean that any one of them actually broke the law. For criminal law, the law enforcement agencies will use the fingerprints. So let's get started. I'll give a series of statements, and you'll just have to say, is it criminal use or is it civil use? So after I read each statement, um, you could feel free to press pause and think about it. Um, I'm going to give a couple seconds anyway and you just have to make the guess. First one, voter registration and driver's license. They usually take your fingerprints, but would it be for criminal use or civil use? Okay, well think about it. If you're registering to vote or having a driver's license, it's not that you broke the law, so this would be civil use. To convict criminals for their wrongdoings. Well, think about the word criminal. This would be for law enforcement agencies. So when it says law, it means law enforcement agencies. Okay, to check outstanding warrants on people who are arrested. Well, think about people who are arrested. They usually broke the law. So this would be law enforcement. And sometimes innocent people are arrested and they'll just take your fingerprints and determine if you're the guy or not. Take and when anyone enlist in the military. Now if you're serving in the military, it doesn't mean that you committed a crime or anything. This is for civil use, for, uh, for the record. To identify missing persons. This is actually for law enforcement agencies to identify victims of disasters. This is also used for law by law enforcement agencies. Used to prevent welfare and social security fraud. This one's a little tricky. You see the word fraud, you might think it's law enforcement agencies, but to prevent the fraud, this is for civil use. 
The key word is prevention. To make positive suspect identifications. Well, if you're a suspect, then you're in a law enforcement agency. When anyone applies for a government job or works for the government. Civil. Civil use. And finally, mostly in criminal work. Well, that's obvious to be law enforcement agencies to use those fingerprints. Okay, let's move on to requirement six. Describe two ways fingerprints can be taken from a person and where these fingerprints are stored. Take a clear set of your fingerprints. Identify which pattern fits each of your prints and find the deltas and the cores. Again, pattern refers to arch, loop, or whorl. So fingerprints can be taken from a person by either the ink and roll method or the digital method. These are stored with local law enforcement agencies and or the FBI. Here's an example of the digital method where your fingerprints are taken and stored digitally on a computer. Getting into the world of biometrics, you could use your fingerprints to gain access to your phone. Adults could use their phones for payments instead of using an actual card from their wallet. And for extra security, you could use your own fingerprint to unlock your phone and your computer as well. And you could use fingerprints to gain access to a place like a building, a highly secured building, for example. Here's the ink and roll method of taking fingerprints. You have an ink pad and you have something like an index card or a piece of paper over here. You open up the ink pad and you're going to press your finger in the pad and get ink on it. And as you come over here, you're going to start on one side of your finger and you're going to roll to the other side. So basically you're doing this. So for example, put your finger and you press it in the ink and you now have ink on your finger. And then again, you start on one side and while pressing firmly, you're going to roll and then that's how you take your own fingerprint. Now it's your turn. Take your own fingerprints and identify each print in the upper left hand corner of each print block with an A for arch, L for loop, or W for whorl. Identify the cores and the deltas of each print. So for example, if you take your fingerprint of your right forefinger or your index finger, you would uh, take a fingerprint in the print box and then identify what it is. In this case, it's a loop. So you would put L for loop. And of course, you would um, highlight or color in or circle the deltas and the core as well. Okay, let's move on to requirement seven. Define latent fingerprints. Explain how fingerprints are found at a crime scene and how they are removed, stored, and used. Latent fingerprints are the individual fingerprint impressions left on an object. Fingerprints can be found using a dusting method. Once they are found, they are photographed, lifted, quote unquote, and put on an evidence tag with the date, time, location, case number, and the name of the evidence technician. Then they are matched with the prints of suspects by fingerprint experts. If a positive identification is made, the prints are held as evidence and used in court. So let's see how a professional does it. Here's a type of brush that they use. It has all these fibers on it. So he first opens the jar. This contains the f very fine powder in dusting, and these are what sticks to the oil of latent fingerprints puts a little bit in a styrofoam cup and then he takes the brush and just coats it with the powder and then he twirls it on the surface like this twirling it back and forth back and forth and as you could see the latent fingerprints are now visible uh, due to the powder uh, sticking to uh, the latent fingerprints the oils that are left behind and then you put a piece of uh, tape over it, like scotch tape for example, carefully, careful not to blur it, and then you carefully peel it off, 
put it on something like a ID card and there you go and that's how you lift latent fingerprints okay let's move on to requirement 8 make a list of career opportunities working with fingerprints list examples of job titles job responsibilities and special schooling necessary so some of the job titles include fingerprint expert fingerprint classifier identification officer fingerprint examiner forensic specialist a latent fingerprint analyst. Now uh, forensics is basically the scientific uh, test or techniques in solving a crime. Um, it's also known as forensic science and criminalistics. The responsibility is to identify fingerprints, process a crime scene, take photographs, package and store evidence, classify as fingerprints, conduct automated fingerprint searches, file fingerprint cards, and testifies in court. Another job is, well, the forensic scientist. These people analyze and interpret physical evidence, including fingerprints, and they present their findings in court. Now, under special schooling, almost all jobs in the area of fingerprinting will require additional schooling and training, such as Criminal Forensic Investigation Series from the Northwestern University Traffic Institute and Quantico Virginia FBI Academy for Advanced Latent Fingerprints. Okay, now the final requirement, requirement 9. List other types of fingerprints, quote unquote, or forms of identification that forensic specialists use to determine who was at the crime scene. So sometimes it's not just latent fingerprints, or what if there aren't any uh, fingerprints? Well, you have DNA from blood, hair, and skin. DNA is sort of our personal fingerprint inside. The only thing is, is that identical twins have the same DNA. Uh, they have different fingerprints, but they have the same DNA. And so everybody has a different DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid, that's what it stands for. And these code for proteins that our body uses, and it basically makes us, us. Why do some people have blue eyes and others brown eyes? Why do people have blonde hair and others red hair? Why are some people tall and others short? Etc. and etc. Now just to give some additional science material here because I can't resist, uh, you have red blood cells and you have uh, white blood cells. The white blood cells are what's in lavender here, like the neutrophil, uh, basophil, monocyte, all these. and it's the white blood cells that contains DNA. DNA is not found in red blood cells, they are found in white blood cells. Uh, just a little trivia there. Shoe prints, bullet or weapons, uh, because you could trace the bullet to the firearm and the firearm to the person. I mean if you have a weapon it's registered under your name and all your information is there. Photographs, artist drawings or police sketches, lineups, lip prints, and more. These are additional types of fingerprints, quote unquote, that could identify a person. Okay, let's conclude with an activity. We have four terms up here on top and four terms down here on the bottom and then the definitions to these terms. Uh, pause the video and try to match uh, the definitions to the terms. Now these four definitions on top will be matched specifically to these four terms up here and likewise down here so there aren't going to be any like crossovers. I mean no line is going to cross this line right here. So go ahead and pause the video and when you're done just press play. Okay let's begin with a fingerprint expert. The fingerprint expert is the person who works for a law enforcement agency who identifies fingerprints. The Bertillon system is the system of identification that uses skeletal body measurements. So it, it was uh, a system it, uh, that used to be before uh, fingerprints. And now we know the story of Will West that made the Bertillon system obsolete. The arch, loop, and whorl are the three major divisions of fingerprint ridges and latent fingerprints are the invisible fingerprints left on items that people touch. Okay, let's move down here. 
The ink and roll method is the method of taking fingerprints using ink and a fingerprint card. The Henry system is a system of dividing fingerprints into categories based on ridge patterns, the arch, the loop, or the whirl. And again, the Henry system is really mathematical, but in basic sense, it, it uses those three uh, uh, patterns that Galton established. One of a kind. Each person's fingerprints are unique, including identical twins. No one else has the same prints that you do. And finally, cores and deltas. These are the two parts of a fingerprint pattern that experts look at when identifying the pattern and person. So big congratulations for doing the fingerprinting merit. The next step is to take your fingerprints, show them and your notes to your commander, and you should be good to go. Congratulations.